Hi, everybody. I'm Jesse. Got this clicker. Man, this is going to be super professional. We literally, there were, we went through like half an hour of trying to figure out what stage furniture we should have. We decided a cafe table covered in gaffer's tape was the answer. <laughs> cafe table covered in gaffer's tape. So, yeah, so this is a talk about making independent media. Um, I am going to talk to you a little bit about my experience, a little bit about some of the experiences of people that I know and admire, um, the things that I've learned from them and the things that I've stolen from them. Um, after that, we're going to take a little break. Uh, everybody should, you know, have a drink, go to the bathroom, and then uh, the great David Reese is going to be here from uh, from television's Going Deep with David Reese, which if you hadn't haven't seen, is one of the best shows on TV. Um, but yeah, man, let's get into it. I usually, um, I usually, there we go. Start with an introduction to me. I'm sure some of you guys like are here because you know who I am and what my deal is. I'm sure some of you are just here because you go to everything here, because you're just super into pod podge pod hodge. <laughs> Hodgepodge, yeah, the thing <laughs> from the place. Um, uh, yeah, so let me tell you a little bit about me. So I started my college radio show, The Sound of Young America, with uh, two good friends, Jordan and Gene, when I was 19. Um, I basically chose radio because video cameras were still really expensive. <laughs> Um, I, I remember going to the radio station and having this moment where I saw them operating the radio station and I thought, wait, that's how radio works? Like, higher is louder? Okay, yeah, I can do that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I did that show weekly throughout college. Um, eventually, my co-hosts graduated, moved to Southern California to pursue actual show business careers successfully. Um, and I was living in San Francisco at my mother's house, uh, unable to find a job, um, and somewhat pathetically driving back and forth an hour and a half in her car, which I was borrowing, to Santa Cruz to do this radio show. And I asked my girlfriend, well, sh should I just quit? Because this is a little bit like, you know, like a, a high school quarterback that graduated wearing his Letterman jacket back to campus. And she sort of gave it some careful consideration and in a much nicer way than this might sound said, well, Jesse, you don't do anything else. <laughs> um, so I took that to heart. Um, I, I was applying for like a thousand jobs at the time and I got exactly this many of them. In fact, to this day, I have still gotten this many jobs in radio um, and you know, my independent media empire such as it is grew out of my inability to get convince anyone else that I was worth hiring <laughs> basically um, uh, I, I started podcasting when podcasting got invented and the reason I did was basically just a, a, a friend of the family said there's this thing called podcasting maybe you should try it I looked into it at first it was a little bit too much work but then a few months later it got to be a little easier <laughs> And I was like, if I could get like 100 people to listen by podcast, like literally the math in my head was like, I'm doing this show, I'm driving to Santa Cruz from San Francisco to do this show uh, for, you know, 1,000 people listening in Santa Cruz. Would I stay an extra hour if I, it meant that 100 people were going to come watch it live? Uh, yeah, sure, I probably would. So I thought, well, I'll do that extra hour of work and podcast and hopefully I can get 100 people to listen. And I got 100. And I think eventually got a thousand, and then I had you know five or thousand, ten thousand, and uh, uh, my first big break actually was here at WNYC. Um, a program director here named Chris Bannon, who is actually in the house tonight, uh, gave me a call. Um, he had heard about my show from a mutual friend, a guy named John Hodgman, and um, he said, "Hey, if you put together some." like best of shows, would you be interested in having them run on WNYC, the largest and best public radio station in the country? <laughs> I gave it some careful thought <laughs> while I was working as a receptionist at the Trust for Public Land in San Francisco making $13 an hour. And uh, I said yes. And um, shortly after that, I signed up with Public Radio International. And that was like a real inflection point for me because I got this uh, I, I got this thing in the mail from PRI, and it was like a revenue projection. And 
I had just assumed that if you had your own nationally syndicated public radio show, there was money there. There's like money would come. I just thought like, oh, it seems like they say a lot of names in the credits for Fresh Air was basically my theory. <laughs> and I don't think those are volunteers. And I got this, I got this five year projection. And at the end of year five, you know, it was like number of stations I'm on and then total amount of revenue coming in. At the end of year five, the total revenue was like $27,000. And I was like, wait a minute. And like, I want to be clear, like it built up to that over the five years. <laughs> so I was like, oh shit, I got to get a job. Um, and that's when I got really serious about making, uh, making podcasting my business. Um, I moved to Los Angeles with my wife who was starting law school in LA. Um, I built a podcast network called MaximumFun.org, which was um, a relatively early podcast network, uh, still in operation now with 20 shows. Um, and I built a business model that is still built around listener support. I'm sure there's, are there a few Max Fund donors here? Yeah, a bunch of them. Um, still built around listener support with a little bit of advertising money, a, a little bit of events money. And, you know, at this point we're, I mean, it's hard to count how, we're like something like 10 real employees and 20 shows worth of people who are making money from their shows in some sort of partnership with us. Um, and all of those shows are, you know, owned by their creators and, and driven by the same spirit that drove me to create The Sound of Young America many, many years ago. And these days my show, The Sound of Young America, is called Bullseye. Uh, it's distributed by NPR and we're on, you know, in stations around the country and we make slightly more than $27,000 a year. But I still, like, if it weren't for my podcasting business, I wouldn't be able to eat, much less pay people. Um, so it, independent media has been, you know, a necessity for me. And in doing independent media, I have had the opportunity, especially because Bullseye is um, an interview show, to meet and talk to a lot of really amazing people who have created things uh, and supported themselves with it. So that brings me to the most important part of our presentation, my 12-point program for absolutely positively 1,000% <laughs> no-fail guaranteed success, um, which also, by the way, uh, will help you grow, uh, regrow up to 50% of the hair on your crown if you are suffering from male pattern baldness. Um, yeah, it doesn't, it's, there's, it's not a guarantee at all. Um, before I get into this ironically named program, I want to say there's two things that I feel are really important to clarify. And they're things that I've only learned are really important to clarify in doing this talk around the country and one time in Canada. Um, uh, the first thing is a lot of these examples are like geeky white guys. Not, by no means all of these examples are geeky white guys, but a lot of these examples are geeky white guys. Um, and I don't want anyone in here who isn't a geeky white guy to feel like not being a geeky white guy disqualifies them from learning these lessons or having these successes. In fact, um, I think that you know, a lot of the examples are geeky white guys largely because that's a demographic that gets into a new media form relatively early and also because of you know, structural sexism and racism in America. <laughs> but, um, but I think, I think that uh, you know, what I find in talking with friends who make independent media who aren't geeky white guys is that um, if they take those lessons, uh, there are often really amazing lanes open to them because they are serving people, uh, they have the opportunity to basically to serve people that the established systems uh, leave deeply underserved. So, you know, if, I, if you just take uh, this, uh, like one quick example, a guy from New York, Combat Jack, this guy named Reggie Ose, uh, he was an entertainment industry lawyer. Um, he, started this pod, he started this podcast where he interviews rappers maybe two years ago. It's now one of the bigger podcasts on the internet. And um, I, a friend of mine is one of the co-hosts, uh, this guy called Dallas Penn. He emailed me one of these shows and I was like, I'm not gonna listen to this, Dallas. This is like two hours and 20 minutes long. This is ridiculous. Yeah, my mistake. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, the reason it was a success is because, you know, it treats its subject, which is hip hop, with a level of uh, thought and care and also kind of a, a native understanding that you don't, simply won't get from the mainstream, whether it's the mainstream of internet media or the mainstream of mass media. 
And so that is an opportunity. So whatever things are distinctive or unusual about you uh, in the context of the internet, those are an opportunity. So I want to make that really clear. I don't want anyone to be discouraged because um, you don't look like me. Um, I mean, it's hard not to look like me. I'm gorgeous. <laughs> but um, the other thing is this. I don't think you're a failure if it's not your full-time job. 100% straight out, I don't think you're a failure if it's not your full-time job. If you think that if it's not your full-time job, you will be a failure, you are going to be bummed out because most, for most people, doing creative stuff is not their full-time job. Um, there are ways to make money. I don't think there's anything wrong with making money doing creative stuff. In fact, I think it's awesome and great and you should try to. But if you, like I did for you know, the first 10 years that I did this show, have another job, that's fine. Pick a job that's, you know, that you can come home at the end of the day and you still have energy to do something that you really care about. You know, pick a job with, you know, I, I told you I worked at this place called the Trust for Public Land. I was a receptionist. It was a really easy job. It didn't pay very much money, but it was enough money for me to eat. Everybody was super nice and it was pretty chill. So that's like the kind of job that you're looking for. You know what I mean? Whether it's like, you know, and everybody, you know, everybody has things they are trying to make room for in their life and anybody who's in extraordinary circumstances, they need those, they need certain kinds of flexibility or difference, you know, whether you're looking for a night job, a day job, a job that pays a lot for a little bit of time, a job that makes you happy, a job that's, uh, you know, boring but you can do other stuff, you know. I don't want you to think that you have to make all your money uh, from doing creative work in order to be a success at doing creative work. Um, the example that I like to give is the, what I call the uncle test. So if you have an uncle or can imagine an uncle who likes to build model trains and has like an amazing sweet ass model train layout in his basement, <laughs> does that uncle expect to make his living from having a sweet ass model train layout in his basement? No. Does he get immense satisfaction uh, from making that? Does he get immense satisfaction from the you know, Saturday, you know, first Saturdays of the month when he opens it up to local kids in the neighborhood or whatever? Yeah, of course he does. You know? So you don't have to be full time. Let's talk about the programs. The first, uh, or the steps, excuse me. The, the first is to start now. This is this woman named Kate Beaton. It's a self-portrait of this woman named Kate Beaton. And she's a really amazing cartoonist. Um, she writes a cartoon called Hark a Vagrant that's about, uh, most l largely about history and literature. Uh, it's super funny. Um, I'm sure she has some fans here. Um, Kate grew up in like the Nova Scotia or something. <laughs> like one of these places in Canada that like you can't even believe it's part of, uh, you know, contemp the contemporary first world. <laughs> uh, you just figure it just everybody like their job is like sail maker. <laughs> Um, but she didn't have, she didn't have internet. She's younger than I am. I'm 34. I think she's like 30-ish. She didn't have internet until she went to college. Um, even in college, because she was not really, you know, an internet -y type person, she didn't really use the internet, except when, you know, she had to, to, for, you know, research for a paper or, you know, to access Microsoft and Carta or whatever. Um, and uh, they got that online now. That's a pro tip for those of you still using the CD-ROMs. Um, so she graduated from college, and she didn't really know what she wanted to do with her life. She was working at this museum. It was literally a maritime museum in, I hope it's Nova Scotia, and I'm not mischaracterizing that. I, my friend Chris Bowman here is from Canada, and he probably knows all the provinces. But Nova Scotia, probably. We'll call it that. Um, and she was just drawing in her notebook one day and uh, working at this museum. And th this friend of hers said, hey, you know, you're a pretty talented artist. And she's like, yeah, I do. I really like, I like, draw, I really like drawing. And she's like, have you ever made anything uh, for public consumption? And she's like, no, I wouldn't. It was just like for me. It's like my journal, you know, whatever. And uh, her friend was a comics artist, professional comics artist, part time, and said, hey, you know, you should put them on the internet. You should make some stuff and put it on the internet and see what happens. And this was, the, the internet in question was so prehistoric, she put them up on a website called Live Journal. Um, <laughs> Which is a website that's, that's mostly just for like things where different characters from Buffy have sex with each other. <laughs> and, um, 
And she found that it was really rewarding, not just, not just because she was sharing it with people, but she was hearing from them, and because she had like a regular outlet, like she was doing this regularly, making it for people, responsible to those people, and she very quickly built an audience. Now, not everybody very quickly builds an audience, and I'm not saying that the first thing you do will be the first thing to build an audience, but I can say with some authority that if you don't start, you will not get to step two. Um, and so it is desperately important, if you want to do something like this, to just start doing it. Um, the internet means that no one, there's no one to tell you you can't start doing it. Even if you want to make films, you can make films with a, you can make pretty good films with a phone that you get for free by signing up for a cell phone contract at this point. Like, there is, the barriers to entry for media are very, very low at this point. So just start making stuff and put it out there. Even if you do it in pseudonymously, pseudonymously, <laughs> hodgepod. <laughs> um, no matter how you do it, start doing something. And when you do it, this is so important, be responsible to some kind of timeline. Be responsible to doing something, finishing it, and doing another thing. This is Jonathan Colton. Um, uh, I'm sure some of you guys know Jonathan's music. These days, he might be best known as uh, the co-host of the public radio show Ask Me Another, based here in New York. Um, he's a brilliant uh, comic singer, songwriter. Um, and Jonathan was like my age now, just like mid-30s. And he was working at a software company that he had never really intended to go into software. He just literally was a secretary or receptionist and had just been like, well, as long as I'm here, I might as well learn how to write computer code. And then he was both able to write computer code and socially conversant, so he quickly became a supervisor. <laughs> and he was like making a good living, and he was like, this is lame. And his wife got pregnant. And on the one hand, he's like, man, I got this, like, I got this nice like, six-figure job and uh, you know, I got this kid on the way and this is really important. And, and I asked him, like, I was like, were you, were you scared to try and do something else when that was your world? Because he'd been like writing songs on the side for fun for himself for a long time. And he said, I felt like having a child, if I didn't quit my job and do the thing that I actually cared about, or at least take a swing at it and like see what would happen, I would be a pretty shitty example for my daughter. So what he did is he quit his job and he started writing and recording a song every week for a year. This is something that a lot of people have copied in the years since, but it was a new idea at the time. And it did two things. One was it made him do stuff. So like he was in his mid thirties, he had made like maybe two albums worth of songs before that. And all of a sudden in a year he made 52 and some of them weren't that great. Uh, but a lot of them were really great. Um, some of them went viral, some of them didn't, uh, a lot of them didn't. Uh, some of the ones that he recorded on the weeks when he had no inspiration were the ones that went the most viral. He did a recording of uh, Sir Mix-a-Lot's Baby Got Back that went so viral that uh, Glee copied it exactly without giving him credit for it. <laughs> um, and the, the, thing that, the thing that he told me he, he learned from that uh, above all and the thing that I know from being a person who obsesses over everything that's wrong with everything that I'm doing is that if you have a drop dead day, if you have a day when you have to do something and then a second day when you have to do another second thing, then all you can do is repeat what you're doing and get better at it. Because you have to repeat what you're doing to get better at it. And otherwise, what will happen to many of us, it depends on your you know, personality and constitution, but otherwise what will happen to many of us is paralysis. You know, I know that's what happens to me when I don't do this. We all have such incredible setbacks in doing these things. And to me, it's not even about learning from your mistakes, although learning from your mistakes is great, so much as like a football running back, when you get hit, your job is just to keep your legs moving and see what happens, because you never know you never know what's going to come of that, you know? All you know is that if you stop, you're done, you know? This is one of my favorite rappers, Killer Mike. I'm sure there's some Killer Mike fans here. 
And I'm sure there's some people who were like, <laughs> I'm, I'm here to see Satirius Johnson. <laughs> But anyway, kill a kill from the bill. Kill a kill from the bill. Um, he was like a protege of uh, Outcast, um, talking about 15 years ago. Um, if you remember when Outcast were at their most famous, they came out with a greatest hits album, uh, and uh, they had a single on it called "The Whole World." Do you guys remember the song? The whole world loves it when you don't get down. Oh, oh, she gets it. Okay. <laughs> so he had a feature. He had a feature on that, and he just totally destroyed it because he's a great rapper. And uh, he came out with an album, and he was the primary protege of the biggest rap group in the world. And uh, his album uh, went, as our bullseye guest from last night, so Feral Monch, so memorably coined, "Wood in the Hood," um, which is the opposite of platinum. <laughs> and uh, he ended up getting dropped from his label, caught in some weird drama with Outkast themselves, this whole mess. And like to some extent, he could have just said, okay, my career from now on is going to be, do you guys know who Spliff Star is? Yeah. Okay, she knows who Spliff Star is. <laughs> so Spliff Star, God bless him. Uh, uh, Spliff Star is this rapper approximately, uh, <laughs> who's friends with Busta Rhymes. And he's, it's this job in rap that's called Weed Carrier. It's like the guy, it's like the guy that's friends with the rapper that has the stuff on him, so if they get arrested, it's the friend that gets arrested and not the rapper. <laughs> and like, that could be a pretty decent career, you know? And Killer Mike could have just been like, well, I'm just gonna be Big Boy's Weed Carrier. I'm gonna be the, I'm gonna be the spliff star to big boys Buster Rhymes, you know? But instead, he did exactly the opposite. Um, he said, I believe in my own talent. He, star he not only did he start a label in order to record and release his own music, um, he started signing artists, and he signed some pretty talented artists. He put out some pretty successful records, and in fact, you know, while he was getting critically acclaimed and sort of rebuilding his career, he sort of stumbled into this partnership with another grumpy old guy named LP, and uh, their project, Run the Jewels, is probably the most successful of either of their careers, and they're both like 40, which in a rapper age is like Crypt Keeper. <laughs> um, and the reason is that, you know, they, they could have shut it down, but they just kept their legs moving, you know? They just accepted, well, you know, it's not always going to be super successful. You get hit, you know? But if you keep your legs moving, you keep going. Um, one of the great things about the internet and the gatelessness of it is that you, if you have a voice that is strong and clear, it can come through in a huge variety of ways. And I often think of my friends, uh, Mark Fraunfelder and uh, Jenny Jardin, who created this blog called Boing Boing. I'm sure some of you guys know Boing Boing. Huge, one of the biggest blogs of the first wave, big waves of blogs. But it actually, um, it, it actually, oh, we don't have that slide, but it, it actually started out as a zine. Um, <laughs> for those of you guys, for those of you guys who are under uh, 35, a zine is something that people <laughs> liked. It was like an ugly magazine that, that people in Doc Martens liked. That's my summary of what a zine was. And um, so anyway, uh, it started as a zine. And, and you know, Mark, was a, Mark thought of himself as a writer and, and above all, like an appreciator, a curator of things that were wonderful in the world. And so he transitioned it to a website just because he heard about websites. In the same way that I never set out to be a podcaster, I just heard like podcasts were a cool way if you wanted to do audio stuff. You know, I never set out to be a filmmaker, but I thought if I want to do something about menswear, I should probably make it in something where you can see the clothes, you know. Um, and that website became monstrously popular. And when they did that, they, they had the sense, I think, to know that what was important about Boing Boing wasn't essential, wasn't essential to the medium. It wasn't about the writing. And in some cases, it is about the writing. You know, I'm not going to tell uh, you know, uh, Roger Angel from The New Yorker that he should host a sports talk radio show. But what was essential about uh, Boing Boing was the point of view. And that's often the case in things on the internet, especially because they're so often so personal. 
You know, it's about you and what you care about and what you have to offer the world. Um, and that is something that can translate between media. You know, you might have, everyone has a different mix of skills and has different opportunities to build different skills. I never expected to be a radio host. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know what I thought I would be. I, <laughs> a failure like my parents. Um, <laughs> My parents aren't failures. They were like, they stopped being, like they had interest, what you might call interesting lives until they were, then they got their act together. So that's a long story. But anyway, they started, a, they started a video series that Shenny hosted because Shenny's really good on camera, you know? They do radio stuff. Shenny does the radio stuff because Mark's embarrassed too. You know what I mean? They, they reach out into every form that they can, that they feel this, uh, this tone, this quality, this thing that makes what they do special translates to, and they don't get hung up on, I'm a this. I talked about what is special about you and your voice and what you bring to the table. Um, that can also translate to a broader brand that's a collaboration between different people. Um, but I, I think it's important I think some people think that in order to be successful on the internet, especially in social media, you have to like totally bare your heart and open your chest. I don't think that that is true. Um, you know, people come up to me and say they feel like they know me from Jordan Jesse Go, and I'm like, yeah, I mean, you know the parts of me that I think are funny enough to say on my comedy show. You know what I mean? That's like half of me. But it is a real half of me. So for me, like I run this company, and, and every time that I think, Every time that I am not sure what to do, um, because it is an actual reflection of me and my values, I can just think, what would Jesse do? <laughs> you know what I mean? And if you have to think, what would this imaginary thing that you made up do, then you're already like four steps behind. Um, this is my friend, Andrew WK. I say he's my friend. We don't hang out a lot together, but he's everyone's friend. <laughs> Andrew, you, you know, Andrew got his start here in New York at art gallery openings with a cassette tape karaoke machine playing his guitar anthems that had literally like 40, 50 tracks of guitar on them and just, rock, just plugging his mic into the karaoke machine and hit, singing his song solo in an art gallery and hitting himself in the face with the microphone until he bled. And that is who Andrew is. <laughs> he believes in, his songs are about partying. I don't know if you've ever heard any of his songs. <laughs> partying is a metaphor for all that is amazing and wonderful in the world, right? And he really, truly, genuinely believes in that. And so he, he got a, a major label record deal. He had a big hit called Party Hard 10, 12 years ago. Um, and then, you know, similar story to Killer Mike. His, his second record got caught up and flopped and he was out of a job, dropped from his record label, didn't know what to do. And I think he had some, he had some the sense himself and, and the smart people in his life to say, what is special about you? It is this idea that partying and celebrating our lives is incredibly important in this incredible dedication that you have to hit. And he remade himself entirely. He hosted a children's television show called Destroy, Build, Destroy, which this was the premise of the show. Uh, they uh, get a thing, like a bus or something, uh, they explode it with explosives, and then they make something out of the pieces, and then they explode that with explosives. <laughs> children, these are children doing this, by the way, like 12 year olds. Um, and like what? That is, as much, uh, that is as much a beautiful, exp it's a children's television show that it is much a beautiful expression of what Andrew W.K. believes about the world as him standing in that art gallery with a cassette tape karaoke machine, as him making a big budget music video for a major label, as him making a version of the Kit Kat song for a Kit Kat commercial. They are all really who he is. You know, Andrew is now a dozen years removed from his last hit, and he has millions of Twitter followers because his Twitter is about this thing that he really is, which is a guy who believes that partying is the most beautiful thing in the world and that partying is a way of expressing the love we all have for each other, right? And that isn't all of what Andrew is, 
But it's a real part of what Andrew is and a significant part of what Andrew is. And whenever he's not sure what to do in his life and career and work, he can legitimately ask himself, what would I do in this situation? And if you can ask yourself that, you're on the right track. Because every single one of you, look, I don't want to sound like I'm at a middle school assembly here, but every single one of you is special, right? <laughs> Every single one of you is different from every single other person here. You all have something that is remarkable and special about you. Many things, a combination of things. And if you can represent that, that is what will help you stand out from everyone else. This is like the most, obviously the most cliched thing in the history of the world. So I'm going to go straight to the picture. Um, you guys know who Chris is, right? He hosts At Midnight on, uh, on Comedy Central. It's a show that many millions of people watch. Um, uh, he's a, he, he hosts uh, the show that comes on after The Walking Dead. Uh, he's going to be hosting a network show uh, this summer. Um, he's one of the most successful television hosts in America right now. Um, if I was telling you who Chris Hardwick was six or seven years ago, uh, I would have to tell you, yeah, when he was in college, he hosted that show, Singled Out. Remember, that show, Singled Out. <laughs> singled Out, for those of you who aren't in the very specific Singled Out demographic, <laughs> was a terrible MTV dating show that was also a cultural phenomenon for like a cohort of people in a five-year age range. <laughs> um, and Chris got that job when he was like 19. He went to an open audition. He was just a student at UCLA. Uh, he got that gig. Jenny McCarthy was the other host, and she became much more famous than he did. Uh, he was kind of embarrassed by the show a little bit. Like, he did a great job on the show, and it's, you know, honestly, it's a good show for the kind of thing that it is. But um, it wasn't any true expression of what he was or what he believed in. And he got paid so little that he had to take an overnight radio job while he was doing the show. Uh, which is crazy. I, one time I talked to the, the, so a couple of people from The State, the MTV show, The State. Uh, they told me that while they were making The State, they had to work as cater waiters. And one time they got assigned to cater waiter for a Viacom event that the boss of MTV was at. <laughs> That's a true story. Uh, show business doesn't always pay what you think it does. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think I'm speaking out of school. I, mean, I don't want to tell Chris's story for him completely, but, you know, Chris became... Uh, a substance abuser, and, uh, and very depressed. And um, especially after Singled Out was gone and he was hosting this terrible syndicated uh, television show called Shipmates, which was, uh, uh, what, was the Rod what was the Roger Lodge show? Um, Blind Date. Blind it was Blind Date on a Boat. That was the pitch for <laughs> Shipmates. And, or as Chris, Chris, told me, uh, Chris told me, the pitch to him for Shipmates was every time that he said no, uh, they increased the amount of money uh, until it was just a pile of BMWs and then he said yes. <laughs> but the whole time he was really sad about it, you know? It really was messing him up that he was doing this. And he decided that even though every single stand-up comedian at every single stand-up club hated and resented him because he had become a television success without actually doing anything, he wanted to be a stand-up comedian. And a few years into his stand-up comedy career, which was, re I mean, it's still, there are still people who resent Chris Hardwick's stand-up comedy in the stand-up world. He's very funny stand-up uh, because he's the guy from Singled Out. A few years later, he thought, I really need to do something. I, don't, I can't be the Singled Out guy anymore. I need to do something that's real about me. And he's like, who am I? Like, I am a child professional bowler, math club, computer club. I'm a nerd. You know, so that is the real person that I am. Like, I've been pretending to be a cool guy so that I could host cool, cool guy hosted TV shows, but that is not who I am. And he started a company called Nerdist uh, based around his persona and a podcast. And that is what led directly to all of those television successes that I just said before. He's also clean and stuff. He's an amazing, amazing guy. Um, this is one of the hardest lessons, and it's one of the ones that. I'll summarize by saying this. This is not necessarily a way, I cannot guarantee you that this advice is going to help you make the most amount of money. I can guarantee you that this advice that I'm about to give you, uh, this story that I'm about to tell you, will lead you to be a happier, better person. <laughs> um, this is my friend Merlin. Uh, Merlin's a brilliant podcaster, a writer, and he was just like a, 
guy who'd been in some bands who made websites uh, when he started a, a blog called 43 Folders. This was relatively early in blog world and it was uh, before the word life hack had been invented. It's a word that Merlin resents very much. Um, <laughs> But it was a personal productivity site, and it just grew out of the fact that you know Merlin was interested in in systems of personal productivity because he's so unproductive, because <laughs> um, he's a mess, um, and uh, it completely unexpectedly, expectedly, it, at its peak, was one of the ten or fifteen most popular blogs in the world. And that is when uh, the word life hack got invented, and Merlin started to think. Wow, I thought I was just writing about a thing that was like a little part of my life that was kind of interesting, which was, you know, uh, this thing called getting things done, this personal productivity system that he didn't even invent. And, and uh, one of his most famous things was uh, a, a, a pile of three by five cards uh, connected with a binder clip with a pen attached to it, which he called a hipster PDA. <laughs> and, um, you know, he said, I am contributing to a pile of garbage. Like, at, so, at, at some point early on, I was teaching people something important, and it was a real, actual thing. Now I am shoveling coal into a furnace of bullshit, um, or shoveling, shoveling bullshit into a furnace of something that needs a furnace, because you can burn <laughs> bullshit. Um, and that is not who I am. That's not who I wanted to be. And he shut the website down. And it was very hard for him, financially, because it was printing money. <laughs> um, but the reason he made that decision was because he hated what he was doing. He thought it sucked. And he said, I would rather be kind of successful doing things that I actually really like and believe in than very successful doing a pile of garbage. And he had faith that you know, the talent that made him successful doing this other thing would bring him some other opportunity, and he would follow up on it. Um, these days, he's an exceptionally successful podcaster. Um, he has the gift of gab times 10 million. Um, and he doesn't do anything that he thinks is shoveling garbage into a, a furnace of bullshit. <laughs> furnace. <laughs> that was a great sentence. Hi, I'm professional public radio host, Jesse Thorne. <laughs> um, Merlin, is actually, Merlin is actually in this next example. Um, Anybody here ever heard this show, You Look Nice Today? Yeah. It's, kind of an impossible, it's kind of an impossible show to describe, but, um, uh, and it sort of doesn't exist anymore and sort of does, but it's a comedy show hosted by these three guys. And none of these three guys, one of them's Merlin, one of them's a very funny now stand-up comedian named Scott Simpson, and one of them's a very successful filmmaker named Adam Lissagor. And the three of them, when they started this podcast, were, were just early Twitter users who had noticed that they thought each other's tweets were funny. Like, they didn't know each other. Not one of them had ever performed in anything other than uh, Merlin's semi-novelty indie rock bands in Florida. Um, they had no public profile to speak of. Uh, they were just three guys that thought each other was funny. But those three guys that thought each other was funny reached out to each other and talked to each other and came up with this weird sort of vague idea for a podcast and just started making it and seeing if they could get it to be something sharp. And what they found was that they, in finding these, you know, in finding these like-minded people, they had found the inspiration to do this thing that, you know, these guys were like in their, comfortably in their 30s. Uh, this thing that they had always thought was part of them, which was being funny, basically. Um, they created a show that no one who had experience in the entertainment industry, I think, could ever have actually created, because it's so unlike anything else. And that's because they were just schmoes off the street who happened to have some talent. And I think it's the combination of the three of the guys that made this possible. And not only did it make it possible to make this show, but I think it made it possible for Adam to say, you know what, I think I'm a talented filmmaker. Uh, outside of the context of being funny on this podcast, he thought, I am actually a worthwhile person with something to say in the world. Uh, now, look, I just went to Adam's house. He lives in a, a full-on filmmaker mansion. He has, a, he has a screening room in his house, OK? Because he's so successful at being a filmmaker. Before that, his top credit was one time because he wasn't in the uh, uh, director of photography union, they let him operate the Predator cam on one of the a Alien vs. Predator, Predator sequels. So they needed someone who was short and wasn't in the union. 
Um, and really, it came from these guys swallowing their social awkwardness, and each of them is socially awkward in their own way, and saying like, hey man, I think you're really cool. Like, why don't we try and do something? You know, and it's something that I relate to, because that's how I started my show. Like, my show, when I started it, I was just like, man, these two guys I met at college, and they weren't really even my friends yet, but these two guys I met in college are so fucking funny. Like, what if I could hang out with them more? Like, what if we did something together? I said, let's look, hey guys, do you want to make a radio show? I'll do the volunteer hours at the radio station, they get you a time slot. And they're like, yeah, you know? There's a lot of pitfalls to working with other people, but you can, it's impossible to succeed without peers who inspire you, without connecting to people that you care about and like and share the same goals and values, or at least similar goals and values. Because those are the people that pick you up when you fall. Those are the people you can do something with. Those are the people who will inspire you. And a lot of people who want to do this kind of thing, you know, you're, maybe you're socially, you're inclined to be an introvert. I know I am. Um, look, I know I seem very elegant here, but <laughs> I'm basically misanthropic. Like, outside of my wife, I'd rather not talk to anybody ever. I host an interview show. <laughs> <laughs> But like, I know that if I want to make stuff, if I want to be a happy person, I have to like reach out to people and take a chance, you know? That's really important. Um, I don't think that you have to be Prince and be ruled by an obsession about owning everything that you create. I don't think that that's necessary. But I do think that if you are going to make something, you have goals for it, right? Your goals might be partly to make money, but probably it's like partly to like connect with people, have your voice heard, change the world in some way, uh, express something. And when you are doing it as an employee of someone else, um, someone else can, controls that. There are times when that works out great. A lot of times that works out great, but if you want to do something really special, um, you might want to think about uh, making it for you and then going from there, right? This is this, this is this woman named Felicia Day. She's really, she's just the coolest lady. She's an actress. She's on, uh, she's on a TV show right now, but um, she was like, she was going to audition after audition and not getting anything. It's like five, 10 years ago. And she decided she was going to write something for herself. So she wrote this sitcom, and you know, they say write what you know. She's really into um, massively multiplayer online video games. Mamovs <laughs> is what they're called. And um, so she wrote a sitcom, basically, about a group of people who get together in this virtual world called the Guild. And, uh, you know, obviously, like, when she, <laughs> when she took that to CBS for a pitch meeting, uh, they were like, you know, can you, how about a sports bar? <laughs> um, but what she decided to do was make it for herself. Now, not only did it become extraordinarily successful, and has she been able to continue to control it, she now actually has a YouTube channel that has a numerous successful shows with which she is not even directly involved. She's enabling other people's voices who have, um, uh, who have really specific and powerful voices that wouldn't be recognized elsewhere. And she also licenses her work. Um, you know, she had the opportunity after the first season was successful to try and make a pilot for the CW or something like that. Um, and what she decided to do was make more herself. She ended up licensing them to Microsoft, who fe featured them on every Xbox in th the world. And it was monumentally successful and allowed her to continue to control this thing that she owned. Um, I am all for, like, partnerships, building bridges, and there are times when, some, when people give you opportunities uh, that are wonderful and shouldn't be passed up. But I, I think it is worth remembering the benefits of controlling what you do. Um, because it's yours. And ultimately, no one else is going to care about it as much as you do. You know, Through all my partnerships with amazing people at PRI and NPR and, and uh, everywhere else, um, the one thing that I've always known is, like, I am doing the show because I really believe in it, and I will not have to compromise the things that I believe in it because it is my show. Um, 
you know. Uh, I'm grateful to have the wonderful people at NPR, but I'm also grateful to know that at the end of the day, like, it's my thing and I can do with it as I please. Um, money is, of course, the hardest question because, like, people often come to this talk and they're like, right, but, like, what's the formula for money making? Um, and I'm just like, internet. <laughs> I don't know, Bitcoin. <laughs> um, but the money doesn't come where you expect it to. That's something that Merlin actually taught me early on. Like, if you have a connection with people, if you have talent and skill, um, money will come from unexpected places. These guys are, are my absolute <coughs> heroes. They're a sketch comedy group from San Francisco called Casper Hauser. And if you haven't heard of them, it's because they're a sketch comedy group from San Francisco, <laughs> the epicenter of the entertainment industry. Um, they all have jobs, so with the missing tooth there, he's a Stanford professor. Uh, with the giant nose, uh, these, each of them is digitally altered slightly. Uh, with the giant nose, uh, he is a, uh, an MD. Uh, he's a federal public defender, and uh, he's also a college professor with the giant ears there. Um, so they all had these great jobs in the Bay Area that they loved, and, but they really loved making comedy, and they knew they weren't going to get a TV show in San Francisco, because that's not real. Uh, <laughs> that's not a thing, unless you're Cheech Marin and the show is Nash Bridges. Um, <laughs> Uh, so they didn't know where their money was going to come from. And one day, uh, James, one of the guys, was at a party and he was just talking to somebody. He's like, yeah, we're in this sketch comedy group and we do, you know, a run of shows in San Francisco once a year and we don't really make any money even though they all sell out and uh, we're like really beloved by San Francisco-based sketch comedy nerds and like once in a while we get an email from Patton Oswalt that says it's the best comedy show I've ever seen. but you know, whatever, and, and this woman said, well, I'm a literary agent, have you ever thought about writing a book? And they're like, no, actually, I haven't ever thought about writing a book. And she's like, let's make a book proposal. They made a book proposal and wrote a book for which they got paid quite handsomely. And in fact, they now have written four books. That's something that you can do from San Francisco that they had never imagined in a million billion years would be part of their job as a sketch comedy group, right? To write point of sale, uh, to write the most bizarre and upsetting uh, point of sale impulse, impulse buy gift books ever. <laughs> um, but the money comes where you don't expect it to, you know? Sometimes, look, I make money from events sometimes, you know? Like, I never thought I would be a guy that put on events, but I realized I have this audience and I, they want to come together, you know? Maybe I should put on events. These guys write books. Merlin Mann does speaking engagements at high tech companies and gets paid 20 grand a pop or something, you know? Like, money comes in weird ways. Capitalism is weird. <laughs> um, but what you have to do is build a connection, uh, build a connection with an audience in, in order to get there. Which brings me to my absolute favorite example. Um, and the one that, I think, this is like, it's such a cliche, like these guys probably come up in every single event here at the Green Space at WNYC. The Insane Clown Posse. <laughs> if you don't know who the Insane Clown Posse is, I'll give you a kind of quick back of the envelope executive summary. They're two terrible rappers who wear clown makeup and have been extraordinarily successful for about 20 years now. Now, I'm obviously making a value judgment about their rapping. Other people think they're good at rapping. Those people tend not to like other rappers besides the Insane Clown Posse, <laughs> or have heard them, or I don't know what they're thinking, but they're, they could be worse. They could be worse rappers. Um, but what they're really, really brilliant at is this. You know, they pro you've probably heard of this thing they do called the Gathering of the Juggalos, right? It's this festival in this, in this like rural town in Michigan it's famous for, among other things, people throw things at all the performers, and there's a drug bridge where you can get any drug. It's like an insane bacchanalia, right? But what these guys realized right from the very beginning, right from the moment when they were suburban Detroit guys who just thought that gangster rap was the greatest, was that there are so many people in the world who are just looking for a place to belong. And when I say so many people in the world who are just looking for a place to belong, I'm talking about five or six billion, whatever the current population of the world is. 
right? And these guys were these guys were lower middle class, alienated young dudes who did not have a place. You know, sort of wrestling, sort of rap, but they couldn't really because they're white guys. Um, you know, they, they, they couldn't find a place for themselves, so they built one. And then they, they extended that to the world of all of the people who were like them. You know, all these, all these young people, and now, you know, grown adults, because they've been around for 20 years, who are just looking for something to say, this is who I am, these are my people, right? And that gathering of the juggalos, like, on the one hand, it's like, you know, it's all the horrible, dumb, gross things that, um, you know, whatever the, the thing where a guy from Vice goes and makes a video there has to say about <laughs> it, right? Like, that's all real to some extent. But it's also kind of a beautiful thing because it is these guys who were really beat up by the social structures of the United States who said, like, what if we made a place for people like us, right? So their band is not even about their crappy music. You know what I mean? It's not even about the, f it's not even about, you know, even, even this weird dumb makeup that they wear, <laughs> like, that's a way of saying, like, w we can all wear this makeup and we can all be part of this group, right? You can wear the makeup just like they can, right? We are, th they are all psychopaths or whatever it's called, I don't remember. <laughs> And that, I think, is something that's really beautiful and something that's really valuable. Not j it's a valuable service to people and it's, a, and, it's, and it's a way to make a living. You know, if you can, if you think about your favorite band, like whatever it is, I'm sure it's the Smiths, um, <laughs> surveying the, okay, 99% spliffs, one spliff star. Um, uh, if you think about what your favorite band means to you, it's not just about the appreciation of the aesthetic of their music, it's about an expression of who you are, right? And I know that some of you are like, no, not me, yes. And if you can tap into that, that is a really deep and powerful thing. Um, and there are a thousand ways to make money from that, many of which are completely morally great and wonderful. Um, and so you shouldn't think that doing that is like a creepy, gross thing. You are give, if you can give people a place to feel like they can be who they are and connect with people that they care about and love, what an incredible thing. Like that's what church is. You know what I mean? Like since I, I haven't gone to church very much since I was in high school because I'm an atheist, but, <laughs> and I felt like kind of a dick just kind of hanging out for the cookies. But, um, but like the thing, the, thing that was, the thing that's so wonderful about church, besides appreciation of a higher power, is that you just have this community of people who have this really important thing in common that's regular that they connect with on that basis, you know? And I, look, I'm not trying to be grandiloquent, but like I think the gathering of the juggalos is church for people. Like it's a way to connect with people that are like them for people who have a really hard time finding those people in the world. If you can do something like that, that's really special. This is the last and hardest one. And I had this conversation with Seth Godin, who's a marketing guru, but um, is not nearly as horrible as that sounds. <laughs> uh, he, wrote this great, he wrote this great book about doing creative work, and, and I felt like I had this gotcha question for him, which is like, what if you're not any good? How, how do you know if you're not any good? And um, there's sort of two answers to that. The first answer is everybody's not any good uh, until they do it a lot in practice and get better. That's I, Ira Glass, one of my heroes and a wonderful dude, one of New York's great public radio people. Uh, he has a wonderful talk on the internet about how he feels like he was pretty much garbage at his job for at least 10 or 15 years. Um, that's true for everybody. So baseline, you have to practice and get better. You will suck at the beginning. Just You just have to accept that. But... You know, then there's that second part, which is like, if I really want to be a success, maybe the thing that's holding me back is that I'm not any, that I don't have the talent. I got a couple answers. One is I don't think talent is that big of a deal. I think talent exists, you know? Like if, you know, if you, whenever you open your mouth, you croak like a frog, you're not going to become an opera singer. 
But I think that most of what people think of as talent is actually just practice and caring, you know? Like repeating things and caring about them. So that's thing number one. And thing number two, the thing that, the thing that Seth Godin told me, is he's like, look, if you care about this thing, I bet that you've spent hours and hours. You know, every musician has spent their entire childhood listening to record albums and obsessing over the guitar solo or the drum fill or whatever. Every musician knows every song that moved them emotionally. You know, every writer can tell you about the, the sentence they read that was perfect. You know, because the reason you want to do this is because you care about it, right? Nobody's just like, I've never read a book, but I sure would like to write one. You know what I mean? <laughs> and he said, and so I think that if you care that much, you could probably tell. And honestly, doing a really good job is going to help you make money, but it doesn't necessarily make you feel better or be a better person. <laughs> like, even doing a crappy job of something is better than not doing it. You know what I mean? Um, and I hope that, I, I really hope that you'll, you'll take that lesson. Rather than feeling like everyone has to be Chopin or Stravinsky, you know, like, look, I'm fully prepared to accept that I'm no Terry Gross. You know, people send me an email once in a while, you're no Terry Gross. I'm like, yeah, yeah, she's better than I am. You know, fuck, whatever. Hey, you know, Shaquille O'Neal's taller than me too, you know? That doesn't mean I can't go play basketball. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the real lesson to this, the real lesson to this whole thing for me is that there, if there is something that you care about doing, um, I want you to spend time doing it. And it's hard to do that, especially when you're a grown up, especially when you have kids, especially when you have a job, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it's entirely possible. We, the, we, all of you who had the, you know, 20 bucks or whatever to come see this, live an extraordinary, extraordinary life. You know, people, 30 year olds only started having teeth like 60 years ago. <laughs> you know what I mean? And making money helps you, uh, making money can help you carve out more space in your life for it. It's wonderful. But what I want you to do uh, when you leave this is to think about the things that you care most about in life and think about how can I spend more time with those things? You know, how can I spend more time connecting with the other people that care about those things too? And if that's five hours a week or three hours a week or one hour a week, that is okay. If you find a way to make money and do it 120 hours a week, like I do, um, then you'll be really tired all the time, like I am. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it, I, I want, I, I've been talking a lot with Elizabeth Gilbert lately, who's the coolest person on the planet. And We did, this, we did this show together, she, mostly her, and a brilliant producer uh, called Magic Lessons about doing creative work. And she has this great book out called Big Magic. And one of the things that I learned is like, the real essential step for most people is not like, how do I gather the most bitcoins, or like, how do I build the most social media following, or whatever. It is, and I think this is especially true for people who uh, don't look like me, uh, people who aren't, a, a, you know, gifted with the gift of the dominant position in American culture, just giving themselves permission to do something that they care about for themselves and, and uh, impose themselves on others in so doing, you know? And if you can just give yourself permission to just make something and like share it with some people and listen to them and then try again the second time, and get some satisfaction from the incremental increase in quality that you can do in between those two things, then you, I promise, will be a happier person and you will be infinity percent closer to making money if making money is also your goal. So, that's all I got for you right now. We're gonna take a 10 minute break, five minute break. We're gonna take a five minute break. <laughs> you guys can go pee and get hammered. 
when we come back here, the brilliant and amazing David Reese will be helping us do an audience Q&A. So think about, think about what you would like to ask us. David is as brilliant a creator and independent creator as I am more so, let's be honest, and handsomer. Um, he's better than me in almost every category. <laughs> I'm younger than he is, thank God. Um, so yeah, we'll be back in five and, uh, and I'll talk to you then. <laughs>